Welcome to Spitbucket. We're here today, Darren de Bortley. Welcome. Thanks, Ken. This is the uh, the family estate, as it were, because you're one of the largest uh, family wineries left in Australia. Uh, one, yeah, one of the largest yep. family wine companies. And you were just saying you've just been on the on the first families tour around uh, Canada. Yeah, we um, every every year the Australian First Families of Wine have been doing a promotion over overseas. Last year they did the United Kingdom. Yep. And this year it was uh, the Canadian market, and it was. Uh, we, we had an absolutely fantastic response. It's a great concept. Um, oh, it just recognises the heritage and, uh, and the contribution the family, family wine companies have made to the, to the Australian wine industry. Can you give us a bit of the history of uh, de Bordelis? Oh, de Bordelis was started by my grandfather, Vit Vittorio de Bordelis, in 1928. Mm -hmm. And um, he, um, he had some... Um, grapes he couldn't sell that year and his background being uh, Italian they liked uh, um, table wine and at that stage most of the wine produced was uh, fortified wine yep. and uh, as a result um, there was a, a bit of a European community in Australia and um, and he had a ready market for table wine and it's quite interesting that, that fortified wine at that stage was about 90 percent of the market it wasn't until 72 that table wine first outsold fortified wine. Which is an extraordinary statistic when you think of, because that's what, 30, 40 years ago now. It's nothing, yeah. And, and scheme and of, yeah, fortified now is, is, is just a drop in the bucket. And the domestic market would be lucky to be 6%. Yep, yeah. going back for a, for a period, probably 40, 50 years, it was, it was nearly all fortified. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, you've not only got the estate here, but you've also expanded down to places like the Yarra. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at wines from from the Riverina today. That's correct. Except for the Cabernet, is a blend of uh, other other regions. Okay. Um, right. Well, we have a squeeze at the. And this is named after my father, Dean Dean de Bordley, mm -hmm. and he passed away in two thousand and three. So um, yeah, we thought to honour him, we'd come out with a, pri um, a range of mid mid priced yep. table wines, and this wine would retail for about ten dollars. Okay. It's, and the whole idea, it's a value proposition. They've done very well, though. Oh, exceptionally well. And this wine at the uh, International Wine Spirit Competition uh, picked up uh, silver to add to its uh, growing list of awards. So for wine that retails at that price. 10 bucks so, is not bad, is yeah, it? Yeah, it's not yeah. bad at all. It's recognisably Cabernet. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it is. It's got the, sort of almost that dry herbal character, mm. that's, um, um, black fruits, lots of flavour. Mm. And, and it's got pretty good structure as well. Yeah, no. Um, it, a lot more structure than you would expect. If someone said, "Here's a ten buck wine," you wouldn't be thinking. Well, you wouldn't pick that. As, I wouldn't pick that as a ten buck wine. No, no. and this is you know, the whole whole idea of you now what we're about as a company is over the living at the different price points. Well, I tell you what. Uh, one of the things about you is you're one of the few people in the world who's actually really created a wine style in, in a sense. Because I mean, Riverine is most famous for the Petritus wines, and that's down to you. Oh, we're very well, much, yeah. Well, we started the, the, the revolution, but we, we, in all fairness, we weren't the very first winery to make the wine, and that was done by McWilliams in 1958. And they, oh, only did, they, did, yeah. and they only did it the once, but uh, what, what it did, and 58, those 50 years of the 50s were, were very wet years, so mm -hmm. they got Petrice very e easily, and they did it with a very thin-skinned variety called Pedro Ziminex, yep. which got infection very easy, easily, and... Uh, when I explained to my father I wanted to make a Petrius wine, and, he, and uh, he said, oh, we can do it in this area. And my immediate response was, uh, bullshit. And then he pulled out the bottle of 58, and, uh, and we're talking about 81 at this stage, yeah. 1981. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, had a look at the wine, you know, and that was said, yeah, we'll give it a go. And 82, we made the decision to leave the grapes no matter what, just to see what would happen. And uh, we're very fortunate in this region, we get... Um, we get uh, moderate temperatures in, in April and... Um, <laughs> pretty and, bloody cold in June. Oh, in June it's bloody cold. But in April, and the thing about Petritus, you want moderate temperatures but high humidity. Mm -hmm. And we get that occurring in, in, in April. Sometimes it's a bit too dry and we have left uh, the grapes hanging until uh, till June and waiting to get the Petritus infection. And sometimes we can get very easily, like this year with all the rain, it's actually it's been a bit of a disaster for the red grapes because... Petritus is not really desirable not, in reds. Not, not its best. Uh, no, uh, and that's because it produces a, an enzyme that basically destroys the colours. But with white wine, it's not an issue. 
And this is the latest release, the, uh, the BO8? 2000, 2008 is our latest release. It's classic Noble One. It's you get all that wonderful sort of honey and... Um, it's almost, yeah, kumquat, cum apricot. Yeah, sort of marmalade. Mm. Mm. I think we can throw that away now. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's, and, and it is, it is an international wine style. Mm. You know, we, when we first started making it, it um, we wanted to make something that was truly uniquely Australian and, and recognised as, as being Australian. Well, I mean, the region's followed on now and, and there'd oh. hardly be a winery here that doesn't make one, I would have thought. Oh, exactly. Mm. But um, it took a while for them to cotton on. It was, um, remember in the early days, it wasn't until uh, 1985 that uh, you know, McWilliams and uh, Orlando started to play around with it. And after that, you know, it was just uh, everyone started just jumping everyone started on board. Jumping. Just, I mean, the, the sort of the, the lusciousness mm. um, of the texture of that is just terrific. Now, that leads to the Black, Black Noble. Yep. Can you tell us about that one? Well, Black Noble is because my father, he himself had interest in, in making a uh, sticky. Mm -hmm. They had tried to do it in uh, 1973 and the results weren't very, very good. Um, but he left the, the, the table one, it was table one, was not fortified at that stage, just sitting in barrels. So when I uh, started um, looking, uh, joined the company in, 80, in 82 as a winemaker, I, this Solero group of barrels sitting up on, on top of the shed had been cooking away for all that time, unfortified. And what was what blew me away was the flavour intensity of the wines. And always, you know, always had the problem when doing tasting. If you ever did Noble One first, always made the um, the rest of the wines look insipid. And this wine had the same effect on Noble One. <laughs> so, oh, okay. and, but it, it created. I thought, well, that's a fan. That's that's. You know, it could be the base of a really fantastic style. Hmm. And uh, that led to the development of uh, Black Noble. And we only released it, you know, released the wine a few years ago. Uh, so we imagine the stocks that we built up, you know, mm -hmm. some of this material is over 30 years old. It's incredibly well, it goes, well, Some of the mother intense. stuff goes back to that 73 Solero that my father had played around with. Mm. And, um, but we did change. I was a bit concerned about the stability of the wine, so we did decide after a bit of time that we should fortify it. So we, we had a bit of a cop out. Yeah, well, it's, but it's still, it's, it's like a, one of those incredibly old, rich tawnies or, um, to a degree, but, but probably mm. even, even more concentrated than most of them. Um, not exactly. Mm. It's, it, it, is a, you know, it is a truly unique wine style. I remember James Halliday at the time when we first released it said, well, I thought, you know, everything that in the wine street that, that could be done has been done. And then Black Noble came along, mm. which is probably the first time a, um, a fortified ma wine had been made using um, using uh, noble rot infected grapes. Yeah, um, it, it's got a sort of a caramel character and a, and a almost raisiny. Toffee, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's just what you need on a day like mm -hmm. this. I hope you're enjoying yourself behind the camera, Clive. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Darren, thank you so much for coming on uh, Spitbucket. No worries, Ken. Yeah, well, thanks very much. Oh. Any questions you, you guys have about uh, any of these wines, about uh, Noble One, Black Noble, please let us know. Remember, we spit so you don't have to. Absolutely <laughs> not no, on, spit, no spitting Not on today. a day too. <laughs> not, not on today. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.